by a Native American. And I knew and I, I knew about her. She's a they have a fictional character version of her called Ava on Hell on Wheels. And she dates uh and she marries the actor Common on the show. I forgot he, he who does he play? Who does Common play? I haven't seen it in a long time because it's like the main character is Ashton, uh not Ashton. What's that dude's name? See, I already forgot. But there was Bohannon, he's the main character. But he, the main character is a guy who also played as uh, Black Bolt, I think, in the Inhumans, and he also played in Star Trek. But my favorite role of him is is, is as a cowboy in Hell on Wheels, and Common is his best friend on there in, in a few seasons, and she dates him, and so it's kind of based on her, and that's really cool. So I recommend that show. Another feat badass woman in history from that show that we did was on um, Stagecoach Mary. Um, so anyway, back to Olive Ann Oatman. She was born September 7th, 1837. She died March 21st, 1903. And she got to see the new century. She was a woman born in Illinois. In 1851, while traveling from Illinois to California with the company of Mormon Brewsterites, and they, they showed the Mormons on the Hell on Wheels. Yo, they were ruthless back in the Wild West. They were ready to shoot, fight with the American government, with soldiers back then, you know what I'm saying? To have their right, you know, to do whatever they were doing in their Mormon thing, you know, multiple wives and shit. Uh, the family was attacked by a small group from a Native American tribe. Though uh, Oatman identified them as Apache, they were most likely... Tokyo Payas or Western Yavapai. They clubbed many to death. Death left her brother Lorenzo for dead. This is not the right beat. That's too celebratory. Uh, <clears throat> they left her brother Lorenzo for dead and enslaved Olive and her younger sister Marianne. Uh, the two were captive for one year and then traded to the Mojave people. While Lorenzo exhaustively attempted to recruit governmental help in searching for them, Marianne died from starvation and Olive spent four years with the Mojave. Damn. Five years after the attack, she was rep rep repatriated into American society. The story of the Oatman Massacre began to be retold with dramatic license in the press, the over-exaggerated, as well as in her own memoir and speeches. Novels, plays, movies, and poetry were inspired, which resonated in the media of the time and long afterwards. She became an oddity in 1860s America, partly owing to the prominent blue tattooing of her face by the Mojave, making her the first known white women, woman with native tattoo on record. Much of what actually occurred during her time with her Native American, with the Native Americans, remains unknown. The town of Oatman, Arizona, is named after the Oatman family and the massacre that occurred therein. Uh, born into the family of Marianne and Royce Oatman, Olive Oatman was one of seven siblings. Um, she grew up in the Mormon religion. She was the oldest. Uh, in 1850, the Oatman family joined a wagon train led by James C. Brewster, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, whose attacks on and disagreements with the church leadership in Salt Lake City, Utah, had caused him to break with the followers of Brigham Young, which they show on my hell on wheels too, in Utah, and led his followers, Brewsterites, to California, which he claimed was the intended place of gathering for the Mormons. The Brewsterite immigrants, numbering between 85 and 93, departed Independence, Missouri on August 5th, 1850. Dissension caused the group to split near Santa Fe in New Mexico territory, with Brewster following the northern route. Royce Oatman and several other families chose the, chose the southern route via Socorro and Tucson. Near Socorro, Royce Oatman, Oatman assumed command of the party. They reached New Mexico in early 15, 1851, only to find the country and climate wholly unsuited to their purpose. Their wagons gradually abandoned the goal of region. The other wagons gradually abandoned the goal of reaching the mouth of the Colorado River. The party.
party had reached Maricopa Wells when they were told that not only was the stretch of trail ahead barren and dangerous, but that the Native Americans ahead were very hostile and that they would risk their lives if they proceeded further. The other families resolved to stay. The Oatman family, eventually, traveling alone, was nearly annihilated in what we said was known as the Oatman Massacre on the banks of the Gila River, uh, about 90 miles east of Yuma, in what is now Arizona. So, uh, and the mom was pregnant with the eighth child. Um, oh no, Lucy Oatman was the oldest. On their fourth day out from the wells, they were approached by a group of Native Americans who were asking for tobacco and food. Due to the lack of supplies, Royce Oatman was hesitant to share too much with a small party of what we assume is Yavapais. They became irate at his stinginess. During the encounter, the Yavapai attacked the Oatman family. The Yavapai clubbed the family to death. All were killed except for, like we said, the three kids. Lorenzo, which was, he was 15, uh, Olive, who was 14, and Marianne, who was seven, uh, Lorenzo, they left him for dead. They thought he was going to die. Uh, Olive and Anne were taken to be slaves. After the attack, Lorenzo awoke to find his parents and siblings dead, but he saw no sign of little Mary and Anne and Olive. Lorenzo attempted the hazardous trek to find help. He eventually reached the settlement where his wounds were treated. Lorenzo, rejoining the emigrant train, had uh, and three days later returned on the bodies of his slain family. In a detailed retelling, which was reprinted in newspapers over the decades, he said, We buried the bodies of father, mother, and babe in one common grave. The men had no way of digging proper graves in the volcanic rocky soil. So they gathered the bodies together and formed a cairn over them. That's how I buried the rabbit out there, because it was like hard to dig. So basically, I dug like a half-assed little grave, and I put the dead rabbit, and I just tried to put dirt and shit on top of it. But then, like, I don't know what, something kept trying to eat it because I had to re keep reburying it. Uh, it has been said that the remains were reburied several times, like I did with the rabbit, and finally moved to the river for reinterment by early uh, Arizona count colonizer Charles Pospin. Lorenzo Oatman became determined to never give up the search for his only surviving siblings. Yeah, man, I mean, that's what you got to do. I mean, I guess in that time he might not have, but I probably would have been looking, I think. Uh, after the attack, the Native Americans took some of the Oatman family's belongings, along with Olive and Marianne. Although Olive Oatman later identified her captors as members of the Tonto Apache tribe, uh, they were partly part of the Topapaya, like we said, or the Yavapai. Um, they lived in a village eight miles southwest of Aguila, Arizona, in the Harquahala Mountains. After arriving at the village, the girls were initially treated in a way that appeared threatening, and Oatman later said she thought they would be killed. However, the girls were used as slaves to forage for food, to lug water and firewood, and other menial tasks, and they were frequently beaten. Uh, during the girls' stay with the Yavapai, another group of Native Americans came to trade with the tribe. This group was made up of Mojave Native Americans. The daughter of the Mojave chief, Espanole, saw the girls in the poor treatment during the trading expedition. She tried to make a trade for the girls. The Yavapai refused, but the chief's daughter, Topica, was persistent and returned once more offering a trade for the girls. Eventually, the Yavapai gave in and traded the girls for two horses, some veggies, blankets, and beads. After being taken into Mojave custody, the girls walked for days to a Mojave village along the Colorado River, in the center of what is today Needles, California. Uh, they were immediately taken by the family of a tribal leader, whose non-Mojave name was Espanole. The Mojave tribe was more prosperous than the group that had held the, whole, the girls captive. And Espanole's wife, Espanillo, and daughter, Topica, took an interest in the Oatman girls' welfare. Oatman expressed her deep affection for these two women numerous times over the years, after her captivity. Damn, I'm to sleep. Uh, let's see. She arranged for the girls to be given plots of land to farm. A Mojave tribesman said in an interview that Olive was most likely fully adopted into the tribe because she was given a Mojave nickname. 
Something only presented to those who have fully assimilated into the tribe. What's up, Blue Jay? Um, all of herself would rather claim herself claim that she and Marianne were held captive by the Mojave and that she feared to leave, but this statement could have been covered colored by the Reverend Royal B. Stratton, who sponsored the publication of Olive's Captivity narratives shortly after her return to white society. For example, Olive did not attempt to contact a large group of whites that visited the Mojaves during her period with them. And years later, she went to meet with the Mojave leader in New York City and spoke with him of old times. Anthropologist A.L. Kroger wrote in an article that the Mojaves always told her she could go to the white settlements when she pleased, but they dared not go with her, fearing they might be punished for having kept the white woman so long among them, nor did they dare let it be known that she was among them. So she was given a chance, but she didn't, she didn't want to go. Another thing that suggests Olive and Marianne were not held in forced captivity by the Mojave is that both girls were tattooed on their chins and arms in keeping with the tribal custom. Oatman later claimed in Stratton's book and in her lectures that she was tattooed to mark her as a slave. But that is not consistent with the Mojave tradition, where such marks were given only to their own people to ensure that they would enter the land of the dead and be recognized there by their ancestors as members of the Mojave tribe. The tribe did not care if their slaves could reach the land of the dead, however, so they did not tattoo them. It has also been suggested that the evenness of all these facial markings may indicate her compliance with the procedure. Well, yeah, I mean, damn, I bet it hurt like a bitch, though. Uh, Olive Oatman, 1860s, on her lecture notes, tell her of, a, of her younger sister often yearning to join that better world where their father and mother had gone. Marianne died of starvation while the girls were living with the Mojave. This happened about 55 to 56 when Marianne was 10 or 11. It has been claimed there was a drought in the region and that the tribe experienced a dire shortage of food supplies. And Olive herself would have died had not Espano, the matriarch of the tribe, saved her life by making a gruel to sustain her. Damn. Olive uh, later spoke with fondness with fondness of the Mojaves, who she said treated her better than her first captors. She most likely considered herself assimilated. She was given a clan, clan name, Oak, and a nickname, Spansa, a Mojave word having to do with the unquenchable lust or thirst. And she chose not to reveal herself to white railroad surveyors who spent nearly a week in the Mojave Valley trading Socialize, trading and socializing with the tribe in 1854. Because she did not know that Lorenzo had survived the massacre, she believed she had no immediate family and that the Mojave treated her as one of their own. So she was in survival mode, man. She didn't know if her, if her brother was still alive or if anybody was still alive. Wait. Damn, we're already at an hour. All right. Uh, we're almost done. So when she was 19, Francisco, a Yuma Indian messenger, arrived at the village with a message from the authorities at Fort Yuma. Rumors suggested that a white girl was living with the Mojaves. And the post command, man, just like now, people be talking shit, spreading rumors. And the post commander requested her return or to know the reason why she did not choose to return. The Mojaves initially sequestered Olive and resisted the request. At first, they denied that Olive was even white. Of course, of, over the course of negotiation, some expressed their affections for Olive, others their fear of reprisal from whites. The messenger Francisco, meanwhile, withdrew to the homes of other nearby Mojaves. Shortly thereafter, he made a second fervent attempt, fervent attempt to persuade the Mojaves to part with Olive. Trade items were included this time, including blankets and a white horse, and he passed on threats that the whites would destroy the Mojaves if they did not release Olive. After some discussion in which Olive was this time included, the Mojave decided to accept these terms and Olive was escorted to Fort Yuma in a 20 day journey. They really didn't have a choice now. Topica, the daughter of Española or an Espaneo, went on the journey with her. Before entering the fort, Olive was given Western clothing lent by the wife of an army officer. As she was clad in a traditional Mojave skirt, 
with no covering above her waist. Inside the fort, Olive was surrounded by cheering people. Olive's childhood friend, Susan Thompson, whom she befriended again at this time, stated many years later that she believed Olive was grieving upon her return because she, she had been married to a Mojave man and had given birth to two boys. She didn't want to leave. Olive denied rumors during her lifetime that she had either been married to a Mojave or had been sexually mistreated by the Yavapi, Yavapai or Mojave. In that reverend's book, she declared that to the honor of these savages, let it be said, they never offered the least unchaste abuse to me. However, her nickname, Spansa, may have meant rotten womb and implied that she was sexually active, although historians have argued the name could have different meanings. Who cares if she was sexually active, man? Within a few days of her arrival at the fort, Olive discovered that her brother Lorenzo was alive and had been looking for her and Marianne. Their meeting made headline news across the West. That's dope. Uh, so in 1857, like we said, a pastor named Royal B. Stratton sought out Olive and Lorenzo Oatman. He co-wrote a book about the massacre and their captivity among the Indians. It was a bestseller for the era at 30,000 copies. Stratton used royalties from the book to pay for Olive and her brother to attend the University of the Pacific. Olive and Lorenzo Company Stratton across the country on a book tour, promoting the book, and they go into this a little bit on the Hell on Wheels. Uh, Olive was a curiosity. Her boldly tattooed chin was on display, and people came to hear her story and witness the blue tattoo for themselves. She was the first known tattooed American woman, as well as one of the first female public speakers. Whoa, I didn't even know. One of the first few female public speakers. She entered the lecture circuit as feminism was developing. Though she herself never claimed to be part of the movement, her story entered the American consciousness shortly after the Seneca Falls Convention. Uh, in, in November of 1865, she married a cattleman named John B. Fairchild. Uh, they met at a lecture <clears throat> that she was given in Michigan along the pastor Stratton. Fairchild had lost his brother to an attack by Native Americans during a cattle drive in Arizona in 1854, the time in which Oatman was living among the Mojave. Stratton did not receive an invitation to the wedding, and Olive never reached out to him again. Though it was rumored that Olive died in a mental asylum in New York State in 1877, it was possibly Stratton who became institutionalized after the development of hereditary insanity and died shortly after he was part of Stratton. Olive and John Fairchild moved to Sherman, Texas, a boomtown. Shout out to Texas. A boomtown ripe for a businessman like Fairchild to start a new and prosperous life. Fairchild founded the city bank of Sherman. And, damn, and together they lived quietly in a large Victorian mansion. Olive began to wear a veil to cover her famous tattoo and became involved in the charity work. In charity work. Uh, she was particularly interested in helping a local orphanage. She and Fairchild never had kids of their own, but they did adopt a little girl and named her Mary Elizabeth after each of their moms and nicknamed her Mammy. Uh, her husband went on to track down copies of Stratton's book and burn them. So, death and legacy. Her brother Lorenzo died on October 8th, 1901. She outlived him by less than two years. Olive Oldman Fairchild died of a heart attack on March 20th, 1903, at the age of 65. She is buried at the West Hill Cemetery in Sherman, Texas. Man, I kind of want to go. The town of Oldman, Arizona, named for her family, was uh, once a bustling mining and gambling town that turned into a ghost town. It was part of the Oldman Gold District, and it is now a tourist stop. Did it? I didn't drink any water. 